Hello and welcome to our Scottish podcast. We have a whole new episode for your ears at last. This week we bring you warmest regards with a special episode about Gaelic bards. I'm Jenny, a poet so sublime, yet known for my dolphin noises and not my rhymes. Finding stories in every nook and cranny. I'm an archivist and my name is Annie. I'm so proud of this. I'm sorry. (laughs) On our podcast, you can binge if our poems don't make you cringe. What if they make me cringe, Annie? (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Stories of Scotland. This week, we're discussing the bardic clan McVurich and having a wee look at the importance of bards in Scottish history. Annie, that didn't rhyme at all. What on earth? I thought we were going to rhyme for 35 minutes straight. I'm so sorry, Jenny. I'm so sorry. (laughs) I don't think our listeners are at all, so it's all right. (laughs) So these are the stories of the classical Gaelic bards, who were the professional poets of the clans. They were an elite class in Ireland and Scotland, who kept the genealogy and history of the ruling families they worked for. So this episode of Stories of Scotland is the stories of Scotland's storytellers. And these are phenomenal stories in themselves because bards held a very high status in Gaelic society. If we go back to early medieval Ireland, we begin with an influential, powerful poet class called the Filly. Technically, the Filly were a higher rank of class than the bards. However, these terms become interchangeable in the early modern period. So, if you want to be the classiest bard, then you're a Filly. They are perhaps drinking whiskey whilst the bards are drinking ale. Though personally, I can't think of Philly without thinking of a young horse. Anyway, they come over to Scotland with a lot of the Gaelic culture. And any of the thousand year old stories that we've been discussing this season would have been written down after being recited by the Philly, who kept the pre-Christian legends and beliefs of the Gaels. They had the ear of the lords and the kings, who would have each had their own royal bard. And these were considered men of great learning and knowledge. Essentially, if your bard is responsible for remembering your history and your family and who won all the battles, they become one of your main authorities of knowledge. In the same way we would pull out our phones and Google our questions about the mysteries of the universe, the medieval Gallic noble would pull out his bard and get him to recite a related tale from his internal index of memorised lyrical poetry. So, hey bard was the original hey Alexa or hey Siri. <laughs> hey bard, how many stars are there in the sky? Ah, good question. Here is a poem about who won the great turnip wars of 1237. The fields were muddy, the sky was grey, our men had been pulling neeps all day. (laughs) I just want to clarify for people who actually learn history from this podcast. Jenny did not tell me about this joke in advance. She just just gave me a cue card to say this line at this point. And she hadn't... she hadn't even written a full poem about the Great Turnip Wars of 1237. If the because, people want it, Annie, I will write it, all right? <laughs> because the Great Turnip Wars of 1237 are a fabrication of Jenny's imagination. We don't know that. I bet there was one bard out there just firing out made-up stories. Fake news. <laughs> Fake long-form poetry. <laughs> Bards have been a feature of Celtic culture for centuries. If we go back to the earliest Irish bards, they are sometimes also associated with prophecies. So not only were they poets, but they almost take the role of magician or seer as well. When Christianity became established in Ireland, the toolbox of the bard was distilled down into carrying knowledge and using storytelling and poetry to disseminate it. This shift means that nobles ended up with two kinds of information keepers, their faith keepers and their history keepers. And so church and bard split the power of keeping the pasts. We're looking at the early medieval period here, 
And with both the church and the bards, it's fascinating to see how much of the past is guiding our Irish and Scottish nobles. So if you think of the Christian Bible and the preaching of this faith, it's from stories that are from hundreds of years past, yet they maintain their value for believers because their teachings are constantly being made relevant by the clergy. And I, I don't think this is a bad comparison because if you think of how the, the clergy would have been completely memorizing the biblical verses in the same way that the bards would be memorizing the, the stories of, of legend and genealogy, it's that skill set that was needed, not just to know the tales, but to be able to convince people of the authenticity and power of them. And for the bards, instead of stories of faith, they are giving us stories of family genealogy, a reminder to the nobles that they are constantly shaping the legacy of their name, that it will be forever remembered by the bards. And then they also give us stories of battles and tactics, We've mentioned the pre-Christian legends that perhaps would have held more weight before they started converting to Christianity. Um, but then the bards also held places as kind of a lawmaker. They memorized laws, um, for example, methods of how to settle a cattle feud. So they've got this multi-role for their bardic practices in society. It's not a simple entertainment, though they are very entertaining. But the knowledge held, shared and passed on by the bards was a social currency. It earned them respect and status. The stories nurtured by the bard were nurtured by the community because they were of the community, they were of their way of life, their wars, their cautionary tales, and so much more. I might suggest that they were nurtured by nobles for nobles, mm. be that the king or the clan chief. Mm -hmm. The brutalities of medieval battle mean that there's definitely not enough laments for the innocent plowmen as there should be. However, we've still got a culture of storytelling amongst everyday normal people who weren't part of the nobility, the gentry of Gaelic society. And in the more recent centuries, we start to see the word Shaniki, the Gaelic for tradition bearer, used as an honorary title for the finest storytellers in the town. And they're the people telling the stories to their community. Yeah, the Shenikes are fascinating and they definitely will be the focus of an episode in the future. I can see the light in Annie's eyes as she talks <laughs> about them. <laughs> but yes, the bards were associated with kings and nobles and so they did their peace to maintain their status and power. And because there was a lot of power in the words of the bards, many nobles would employ a praise poet to bolster their credibility and popularity with the people. So I found a 17th century account by Martin Martin from the Isle of Skye and it's on the power of the bard. This is from 1703 so it's much later than any of the medieval bards that we've been covering. Jenny, Jenny, would you like to read it for us? Of course, of course! The orators, by the force of their eloquence, had a powerful ascendant over the greatest men in their time. For if any orator did but ask the habit, arms, horse, or any other thing belonging to the greatest man in these islands, it was readily granted to them, sometimes out of respect, and sometimes for fear of being exclaimed against by a satire, which in those days was reckoned a great dishonour. Ah, so even a clan chief could be afraid of humiliation caused by a bard. Martin Martin does say that by this time period, the bards are barely making a small salary. This is because their insolence lost them both their profits and their esteem. So clearly, if satire becomes too cutting, then it loses you your coin. However, a bard's words could be sharp. Yup. There is even a tale of one Irish chieftain who was roasted so hard that he upped and left his region and never returned, just exiled in embarrassment. I would love to hear the poem. There once was a lass from Inverness. She thought her podcast was the best. She wanted a prize, but she wasn't surprised 
when nobody laughed at her jest. <laughs> Let's take a look at the McVurich Bardic family. They first make their names as bards across the Irish Sea on the Emerald Isle. So much of the research we've been looking at for the McVurich Bardic family comes from the excellent Gaelic scholar and poet himself, Derek Thompson, who published his work in the Transactions of the Gaelic Society of Inverness. Oh yes, I know them well. They still exist, you can get a membership. Amazing, I used to read it along with the Bino. He was so excited by the McVurichs that in his third paper about the family, he admitted to having an obsessive interest. And this is understandable. This family are fascinating. What's so impressive about them is the length of service that the McVurichs held literary office in Scotland. Each generation passed the bardic mantle down from the 13th century to the 18th century. That's a really long time. (laughs) And like all good origin stories, the Bardic McFurichs start with a legend of a brutal murder. Just like Batman. Murachach Alapanach was part of the Odale line of acclaimed Irish professional bards. So we are going way back to the 13th century, Annie. And even for us, this is pretty far. Hang on a minute. If he's an Irish poet, then why is his name Muirachig Alapnach? Because Alapnach means Scottish in Gaelic, so how did this work out? Ah, I thought you'd ask that, Annie. So in 1213, Muirachig was living in Lissadell, in County Sligo. The king of Tyr Honnell, Donal O'Donnell, had a steward named Fionn, who was travelling to collect taxes on behalf of O'Donnell. And I just want to highlight, Annie, that one that entire paragraph was very difficult to say and that Donald O'Donnell was a big inspiration for Martin Martin. Oh, weesh, Jenny Jenny. <laughs> now, we've got English translations of this encounter from 1213, so we'll just try our best to make sense of this medieval mess. So Stuart Fionn met Bard Murachag in Lissadell, and Fionn was described as a plebeian representative of a hero, which is quite a sick burn if you ask me. I felt that 800 years later, ouch. (laughs) (laughs) So plebeian is perhaps to contrast um, the different social standings of Fionn to the poet Muvichig. The word plebeian comes all the way from ancient Rome to distinguish a normal citizen who wasn't part of the ruling class. Ya pleb. (laughs) And we, thanks, Jenny. We used to, I used to call my siblings plebs all the time <laughs> without realising I was exactly equal to them. <laughs> That's such a private school thing to do. <laughs> I did take standard grade Latin. <laughs> you didn't? Yeah, I took standard grade Latin. They gave you every word you needed to know. Horatia est in casa laborat. Horatia is in the kitchen working. Wow, bonus Stories of Scotland Patreon, Jenny teaches us Latin. (laughs) I don't want anyone to sign up for that because you will not learn any Latin. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, as we've discussed, the bards are some of the most powerful people in the Gallic Dominion. So we know that there's a vast difference in the socioeconomic power of these two people. But Fionn isn't just any pleb, Annie Annie. He's a plebeian representative of a hero. So perhaps he had a wee bit of extra wind powering his plebe perspective. Because our wee plebe Fionn began to wrangle and argue with Murichig. This enraged our bard, whose fragile ego could not bear the confidence of someone he saw so far beneath himself. And so Murichig made the heated decision to put Fionn down to show him where he belonged. Now, as a talented bard, did he decide to put Fionn down with his words? Did he engage in an ancient rap battle of scathing comments and witty asides? No, of course not, (laughs) for he knew that though the word may be mightier than the sword, the poem is not mightier than a very sharp axe. And so he grabbed a heavy, lethal, freshly sharpened axe and dealt a blow to kill Fionn on the spot. 
I'm just going to say it, it feels like a lot of medieval Irish feuds could have been avoided if noblemen and deities would just stop killing people's stewards. Well, if people would just stop leaving all these really sharp axes around, then maybe that, you know, why not just leave large carrots from the harvest about and let them whack each other with it? Well, we can't leave large root vegetables hanging around after the turnip wars of 1237, Jenny. <laughs> Mürichig knew that revenge would be swiftly en route, so he fled the scene of the murder. Donal O'Donnell was furious when he learns of the death of his steward. Pleb or not, a steward is a representative of him, and he cannot allow this murder to go unpunished. So he pursues Mürichig across Ireland, plundering the lands as he passes through. Mürichig tries to find sanctuary in Dublin, but O'Donnell's army compels the people of Dublin to banish the bard, and not just to the next city, but across the waters to Scotland. Ah, so this is how he becomes Mürichig Albanach. Yep, just a little bit of axe murder and banishment by everyone in a city. (laughs) But while he's over here, he spends much of his time grovelling and apologising to Donald O'Donnell. I'm not going to lie, Jenny. It's the worst kind of apology poetry. (laughs) Because... Do you know a lot of apology poetry, Annie? (laughs) Just think of all the times that someone has apologised to you and not really meant it or not even realised why you were annoyed at what they Mm. did. Okay, fair enough. Because Murikig never acknowledges that murdering someone is wrong. I am sorry that you feel bad about me killing your pleb. (laughs) (laughs) In fact, Murikig manages to portray himself as the victim because he has been banished from Ireland, the home that he loves, forgetting that the real victim is now dead, (laughs) literally buried in the ground. There's such a gaping abyss of difference in the social status between the bard and the victim he murdered that Mürichig doesn't consider it a moral issue at all. Do you know what's a moral issue, right? I'm not going to get to go home for Christmas, all right? That's a moral issue. I've missed St. Patrick's Day for 12 years in a row now. That is not moral. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, channel this energy for me, Jenny, because I've got one of Mürichig's verses in translation. So you need to be an Irish bard with a very limited moral understanding of the value of human life. (laughs) Easy. My feud with the man is over a small matter. A peasant who gave me abuse. That I merely killed a servant. God, is that a reason for hostility between us? Yes! (laughs) Yes! Murder is a reason to fall out with your friends. And don't ever let anyone tell you otherwise. Ah, well, this is why there's secrets between us, Annie. <laughs> okay, break character, break the spirit, Jenny. It's it's creeping me out. <laughs> so, Mürichig wrote a verse that roughly said that he would understand his banishment if he had perhaps killed the son of a king or a clan chief with a very sharp axe. But he had killed a common nobody, And so his punishment was far, far too severe. You guys are like super touchy about this. (laughs) (laughs) But this is also the semi-historical legend of how the McFurich clan came to Scotland. Our murdering banished bard, Mürichig Albarach. But just as a side curiosity, Mürichig wasn't just a murdering bard. It was one pleb! Will you people never get over it? (laughs) who got banished to Scotland, he was also a crusader. You're damn right I was. <laughs> Thought we couldn't get any more medieval and now you're pulling out the crusades, Annie? Yes, so the crusades were the religious wars where Western Europe, led by the Latin church, wanted to take Jerusalem and this holy lands out of Islamic rule. Now, Mürichig was part of the Fifth Crusade. I would have gone to the other four, but my axe had been confiscated. (laughs) (laughs) Now, the Fifth Crusade was focused on taking control of Cairo. 
with the idea that Cairo would then become a stronghold to claim Jerusalem. As I mentioned, this was Western Europe under the leadership of the Latin Church. Uh, for the Fifth Crusade, we've got in the Latin Church Pope Innocent III and his successor, Pope Honorius III. Wait, 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 you're telling me that these lads were named Innocent and Honorous after leading a crusade and I'm known as McMurich the Murderer forever! I've lost my accent, but this is outrageous! <laughs> Sorry, Murichig, this is just the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. That's Murichig the murderer to you. <laughs> but the Fifth Crusade would have seen our Murichig going down to Rome and then Cairo. So for a medieval bard, he's incredibly well-travelled. I've seen Murichig described as a pammer, which makes him seem more like a pilgrim. So they're called pamers because they would bring palm leaves back from their pilgrimages in the shape of a holy cross. So not for palming off all responsibility of a murder that you committed. Mm -hmm. But you know, considering how good Murichig is with an axe, it wouldn't surprise me if he had more of a, a warrior bard role in the crusade. Okay. Though whatever Murichig contributed to the crusades, it wasn't enough to win. The Fifth Crusade was a Muslim victory and resulted in an eight-year truce between the Ayyubids and the Crusaders. However, after 15 years of banishment in Scotland and a slight detour to Cairo via Rome, Murichig was allowed to return to Ireland. But the legend suggests that he left his children in Scotland and thus the seeds of a new bardic family were sown. From their heroic beginnings of rap battles and axe murder, the McVurich clan had a knack for the written verse. If we follow this poetic inclination from generation to generation, each young bard is meticulously trained by his elder. And what do you know, 337 years later, we find ourselves in 1550, around the time that Njal Mor McVurich was being born. By this time, the McFurichs are very well known in Scotland, and they are the bards of Clan Ranald, a powerful branch of Clan MacDonald, who themselves are one of the strongest, most influential clans in all of Scotland. Both Clan Ranald and Clan MacDonald have huge amounts of genealogy and history to remember and recite, but they are also massively influential in the power and politics of the Highlands, so there are also many new and current affairs that need to be recorded. So there are four poems that are attributed to Niall Moore McVurich. My favourite of these is a cheeky one called I Spent Six Nights in Dunvegan. It was composed to celebrate the marriage between John of Moidart, son of Clan Ranald, and Moore, daughter of Ruby Moore. For people learning Gaelic, so we know Ruby Moore means Big Ruby, but more can also be a girl's name. I think it means Marion. Ah, beautiful name. And such a momentous occasion was this that Clan Ranald gifted John and Moore 22 Merklands of land. <laughs> so, how much is 22 Merklands of land, Jenny? Well, one Merkland is eight ounce lands, so it's a uh, hundred and seventy-six ounce lands of land. Okay, and how much land is that, Jenny? Well, one ounce land is five groat lands, so eight hundred and eighty groat lands. And approximately in in land terms, you know, do do we do metrics here? Well, there's four penny lands in a groat, and so in total, they were gifted a whopping 3,520 penny lands worth of land. I'm suddenly understanding why Mirka killed that pleb, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how many acres is this? I have absolutely no idea. But they better hope they're also being gifted a really big wallet, as that's a lot of pennies, Annie. Okay, well, I very much enjoy your 
calculations here, Jenny. And I admire the detour that this episode about the McMoot. Annie, you took us on a detour to Cairo, all right? So don't get <laughs> mad at me for doing, some, for doing some ancient math. But these measurements are based on the amount of rent paid on the land rather than the specific area of the land. Oh, okay. Well, do you know how much land someone would get from Merkland? Can we just can we just agree that they got a lot of land for getting married? Yes. Okay, brilliant. So on such a momentous occasion, Clan Ranald would bring the clan bard along to the wedding, as he would be providing entertainment, just like a wedding singer would be today. And of course, our bards are keeping the genealogy and weddings, births and deaths are often the most important family events. And he would be participating in the merriments along with the whole wedding party. We can see this quite plainly in the poem that he wrote about this occasion. <clears throat> Six nights I spent in the dun, billets that were not false nor cold, abundant drinks being drunk from gold, a great wine hall where hosts abound. The household members all around make up a great and merry clan. The king's peace and prosperity gain from the strong force that drinks there in private. Harps cry and heavy wine bowls clash. Practice no hatred or deceit. Clink of shining branch-etched cups. Ale that inebriates and a strong fire. The king of old Vur's sprightly race. His fellowships with ports the poets. In his royal hall, his thronging host, ready to give and get more drink than they can dream. We were drunk twenty times a day. <laughs> we were no more reluctant than he. Alas, what I'll kick in our sustenance. Four and seven and six and, and three. <laughs> well, Jenny... I'm sure that that has more of a rhythm in its original Gaelic. This sounds <laughs> like a right good old time. I like how there's nothing about the actual wedding, let alone the reason for this massive week-long party. He should have just called it, I spent six nights in Dunvegan and I remember none of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it does sound like he was so full of merriment that he couldn't quite remember the ceremony, let alone the names of those getting married. It's a bit like a wedding photographer only taking pictures of the drinks at the reception and not the happy couple. (laughs) But this poem allows us a glimpse into the world that the bard was moving within. One of the grand weddings and important occasions amongst the highest echelons of Gallic nobility. And we also see just how embedded the bards were, not just within the daily lives of the clan, but also the six-day parties that come with the job title. Well, I do love this poem. Another one that he wrote was a lyrical love poem that scholars think is about a time he seduced a noble lady, or maybe she seduced him. It's all about seductive eyes across the room, excessive winking and glances so smoky that if they were to be shared nowadays, the fire alarms would go off. Do you want to hear it, Annie? Uh, uh, Yes, please do share, Jenny. I love a romance poem. There are two in the house tonight whose secret their eyes do not hide. Though they are not lip to lip, keen, keen is the glancing of their eyes. It is the silence that puts sense on the fervent glancing of the eyes. What good do silent lips do when the eye tells the tale of their love? Alas, these lying ones allow no words to cross my lips' soft eye. Understand what my eye says as you sit in the corner yonder. Sorry. It's just so much eye. (laughs) understand what my eye says as you sit in the corner yonder save us for the memory of tonight sad that we are not ever thus do not let the morning in arise and drive out the day ah mary graceful foster mother 
since you are the patrons of the poets, deliver me and take my hand farewell ever to last night. Wink, 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 wink. Wink. Wait, give me some sunglasses. Those lusty looks are blinding. <laughs> uh, looks so smoky, he just about seduced me 500 years later. <laughs> <laughs> so the other two poems we have attributed to Niall Moore McVeerich are A Reverent Celebration of God and A Satirical History of the Bagpipes, which quickly descends into poking fun at the droning pipes and those who play them. The four poems that we do have show a wide variety of work and showcase the bard's versatility as a poet. And while only four poems remain, this isn't to say that he had like a really incredibly easy time of it, is it? Like, these are only the ones written down. He didn't just kind of drink and copulate and write a poem every 15 years did he because if he did that's a sweet deal that's nice oh no 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 no. the majority of his work would have been held in memory and passed on orally to his son and two other bards but he definitely did drink and have a very good time of it as well (laughs) and now Having travelled from the McVeerich clan Bardic origins in Ireland to Scotland and with a few detours along the way, <laughs> we now come to the end of the lineage of the McVeerich bards. Neil McVeerich was born between 1636 and 1639. That's off to his mum. That is a long labour. <laughs> Well, it can be difficult to date births exactly, and Gaelic scholar Derek Thompson was slightly obsessed with this and came to this estimation based on memories recounted from Niall's childhood. Mm. But we do know that he died in 1726, so he lived a long life and was the bard for Clan Ranald during times of great political and cultural change. Like the bards in his family before him, His job was to remember and record the history of the clan, as well as to make his chief look good and reaffirm his status. We can see this after hundreds of years of fine-tuning in some of the lines he wrote about clan chief Alan of Clan Ranald, lauding him with praise. I never saw one like him in respect of his kindliness, ingenuity, his fineness of character his hospitality, and his open-handedness. And here's a snippet of a very moving piece that he wrote upon the death of his clan chief. There is no warmth in the rain now, since the death of Alan, who was ever mild. The wind is rough, clamorous, rude, and the sea answers it stridently. The waves fall with a sudden roar. I love that line, there's no warmth in the rain now, because, I don't know, I think our rain has never been warm, obviously. (laughs) It's a cold country. I mean, I've certainly had experiences where you're outside in Scottish rain and it does feel like the sky is mourning with you. Mm. Um, I, wow. I think this is my favourite poem in the episode. Mm. So Chief Allen of Clan Ranald died in 1715 in the Battle of Sheriff Muir, a pivotal moment in the first Jacobite uprising. And one of my favourite battle songs of all time. We'll have to look at that at some point. By this time, Nial was an old man, but in these few lines, it is as if all of the colour has drained from his life. There is a marked pessimism in the poems he writes in the second half of his life. From childhood, he was acutely aware of the centuries-old bardic tradition he was carrying on. And while this afforded him the power, place and privilege of his own position, it was no doubt a heavy weight on his shoulders. Highland culture was changing. The union of the crown in 1707 meant that power was dramatically shifting. 
The first Jacobite uprising had just been quashed and on a personal level, Chief Allen, a great supporter of the arts and the bardic tradition, had been killed during it. His death, along with the changing political landscape, meant that Niall McFeurich knew that the writing was on the wall for his family's bardic lineage. By the time he was old and grey, he knew that both his craft and position was coming to an end. This last McVeerich continued composing long-form poems of over 150 lines, rich in Clan MacDonald and Clan Ranald family history, late into his life. He died in 1726 and is considered the last of his family to have held this position, though a couple of his descendants did practice classical Gaelic poetry. I think this shift that we're seeing in the 18th century is because of this change in Gaelic clan structures that you've mentioned. They are buckling under the pressure from the changing social and political landscape. The bard no longer has the same power that they did centuries ago. You have written law, so you're not relying on someone to recite your cattle feud dispute settling schemes to you, <laughs> you know? <laughs> More broadly, the lords and nobles of the Scottish Lowlands and England would see the chief and the bard sitting at the same table to dine and they would make the chief feel ashamed of this because they considered the bard to be a mere entertainment and they would never dream of dining alongside their entertainment. People from outside the clan system didn't realise the cultural significance of the bard and how they were the beating heart of the clan's history. Or perhaps they did realise this and they thought that it would be another piece of the Highland identity that if they stripped it away, they get closer to integrating the Highland clans into the rest of the UK, into making them less of a threat. There's so many points in history that we can see the unravelling of the Highland clans and see them losing power in different ways. And the loss of the bard is of huge significance because you're not just losing this tradition, but the weight of centuries of words that have been carried with it. I think it would be wrong to end this episode without one of the most famous poems of the McFurich Bardic family, which is Clan Donald's Call to Battle at Harlaw, which was fought in 1411. Ah, this is an amazing war poem. It is by Lachlan Moore McFurich, and there's a marvellous pattern to it. The English version comes from poet Robert Crawford, and we'll just read the last section of it so you can get ready for battle whatever you're doing next after listening to this episode. Today is for triumphing, you hardy great hunting dogs, you big-boned bra battle boys, you light-foot spry lion hearts, you wall of wild warriors, you veterans of victories, you heroes in your hundreds here, you clan of Con, remember this, strength from the eye of the storm. Whoa, stirring me up there, Jenny. Put your axe away, Murikig. It's all right, I was just going to take out a pleb with it, no one important. <laughs> <laughs> so the McVeerich Bardic family are a superb example of the Scottish Bardic traditions. Um, myself and Jenny, we subscribe to a Highland storytelling philosophy described by the marvellous poet Hamish Henderson, and it's the idea of a carrying stream. This carrying stream represents the traditions of this place, bound by the people and environment. It is a constant source of inspiration for creatives. Our tradition is something that enriches what we do, just as though we are taking water from the carrying stream. Every time we make something new, we add a little bit more to the flow. The carrying stream constantly replenishes, and the more people who are inspired by these traditions, the more this carrying stream brings life to our work. And even though there's no longer classical Gaelic bards from unbroken generational practices anymore, 
The spirit of this work still inspires new poets, musicians, creatives and podcasters all across Scotland. <laughs> I love the idea of the carrying stream. That anyone who wants to draw inspiration from tradition is so welcome to do so. Yet, two people can approach the stream in the same place. Take exactly the same stories or songs or poems and what you take away from it is always going to be different because just like a stream, our tradition is alive. It's constantly moving, constantly flowing and constantly renewing. Thank you all so much for listening to Stories of Scotland. It's so kind of you to join us on the strange and wonderful adventures we find for this podcast. To Cairo! If you want to support us to make this marvellous We Show, you can follow, like and share our social media content. Or if you are a mega fan of our Scottish heritage kinship, then you can subscribe to our Patreon. Go to our broth and smoke us some kippers. We're sending our Patreons shiny stickers! (laughs) (laughs) For our Patreons, we give many thanks. They put gold coins into our banks. We make extra content for our Patreon clan as a way to say Moran Tang. <laughs> Moran Tang? Are you just making words up now, Annie? <laughs> uh, Gaelic for many thanks. Ah, okay. So, without any further dreadful poetry, let's give a thanks to these marvellous and generous people. Beth, Catherine, Sophie, Caitlin, Bridget, Marion, Lindsay, Judith, Jill, Erica... Jackie, Alex, Anne, and Michelle. Thank you guys all so much for supporting us. We've seen a massive swell of support for people wanting the promised and fabled shiny stickers, and we're currently designing them and we'll send them out as soon as we can. We are now at the end of this episode. A big hurrah, and we wish you good health with Slanjava. And I'm away to drink Prosecco in a spa. Have a lovely day. Slanjiva. <laughs> <laughs>